And so, ladies and gentlemen, with a great deal of pride and pleasure, I present to you Electro, the Westinghouse Moto Man. Electro, come here. And here he comes, ladies and gentlemen, walking up to greet you under his own power. Today, we are going to investigate what happens when humans create artificial bodies. Why do we do it, and what do they mean? This video is an investigation into the history of the wax figure and the animatronic, placing two distinct stories onto one timeline. If you are new to the channel, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing for more. Let's jump into it. In Walter Benjamin's landmark essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, the German philosopher argued that the value of art diminishes when it is mechanically reproduced, for its aura and uniqueness disappeared. Even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. Applying Benjamin's framework to anthropomorphic puppets, wax figures, and audio animatronics reveals that these three artworks have a live aura and presence as works of art. However, as mechanical reproductions of human bodies, these figures lack the unique aura of human life and capacity for experience. Since the dawn of the wax figure, humans have attempted to better approximate bodies to cross beyond the uncanny valley. These figures are not reproductions of art as Benjamin described, instead they are mechanical reproductions of the human body. People have continued to approximate human movement to make these artificial bodies believable through pneumatic or electronic animation. Because the histories of anthropomorphic wax figures and lifelike animatronics remain separate from each other, the first portion of this thesis draws a continuity from wax figures to animatronics in these two separate histories of technology. These mechanical reproductions of the human body were also labor-saving devices, lessening the need for live performers. This history of animatronics is a unique history of wax figures. How were wax figures even made? The process of making realistic wax figures has little changed over the centuries. The sculptors from a 2021 How It's Made segment used the same process described in an 1889 Scientific American abstract on producing wax celebrity figures. First, the sculptors create or hire a model to mold with plaster. In the best case scenario, their subject is living, willing, and able to be measured precisely. Both 1889's and 2021's processes used photographs of the subject to map their face in three dimensions. The case of using clay to create a hollow plastic mold for wax is simple, but the same is not true for the case of the live model. The sculptor places a toothpick between the model's teeth so that they can breathe while being encased in plaster over an inch in thickness. The sculptor removes the mold from the clay or person, pours in melted beeswax to create a hollow shell, removes the excess liquid wax after a shell hardens, and then removes the plaster mold entirely. The sculptor works wax magic to texture and paint the wax human. The eyes are crafted extremely carefully with painted pupils and irises, and simple red strands are used for the blood vessels. Strands of hair are individually set into the wax, melted precisely. These same eye-popping and hair-pulling processes are used with animatronics. This wax process dates back to the ancient Mediterranean, but early modern Europe saw a takeoff for wax as a literary device art form, and scientific tool. English dramatist John Webster used wax figures as a plot device in 1613's The Duchess of Malfi. The titular Duchess is tricked at the sight of wax figures into thinking her family was dead. This use of wax effigies in literary plot demonstrates English familiarity with wax figures in the 17th century. Wax sculptures commonly made death masks and effigies. They also acted as molds for bronze casting. 
Wax figures became body doubles for researchers and students of anatomy during the 18th century. Wax figures were variably useful in arts, sciences, and culture. The same must be said for audio animatronics and the animation of wax figures. While not made of wax, these robots similarly embody their subject. There is an extensive early modern history of robotic performers as art. Clockworkers crafted early automata in the 14th century at European cathedrals. Two centuries later, in 1509, Leonardo da Vinci designed and constructed a mechanical lion that could walk. The Jacques Droz family were famous watchmakers and automata craftspeople in the late 18th century France. They created three figures, the musician, the draughtsman, and the scribe. The scribe was capable of inking a quill tip and writing a reprogrammable message up to 40 characters long on a sheet of paper. The scribe famously invoked Descartes, writing, I think, therefore, I am. The Jacques Droz family was able to give motion and animation to a thoughtless figure, another step in humanizing wax figures. Not all artificial performers were made to be human. Instead, the robots came. In the 20th century, Westinghouse Electric Corporation's Electro, the Moto Man, and his dog Sparky were two of the most popular early animatronic performers. They put on regular performances at the 1939 World's Fair in New York City. Electro responded to voice commands through a telephone, cracked jokes, lit up, and even smoked cigarettes. Electro's movements were incredibly simple by today's standards but he nevertheless captivated audiences as an engaging and entertaining performer. If you've made it this far, please consider subscribing. The English word robot is derived from the Czech word roboto, translated as serf, slave, or forced to labor. Karl Čapek in 1921 popularized the word robot in his play R.U.R., or Rossum's Universal Robots. The play about robots replacing humans was an allegory of the Bolshevik revolutions in 1917. The robots represented the masses of workers as they revolted against their creators. While also a symbol, robots fundamentally are labor-saving devices. Their job is to labor. In the case of theme park animatronics, their job is to perform and entertain. Unlike workers, it remains unlikely for robots to revolt and strike for better working conditions. Robots, the mechanical slave, are mechanical reproducers of human labor. Robotic performers and animatronics replace the labor of performance, able to replicate precise motion for thousands of shows in a row. The Walt Disney Company became incredibly interested in robotic animation technology following Disneyland's debut in 1955. After redefining two-dimensional animation, Disney's major goal with developing animatronic technology was to invent a three-dimensional form of animation. According to the corporate history of the Walt Disney Company, their first attempt at robotic theater included an automaton model of American actor Buddy Ebsen. Engineers developed this miniature mechanical dancing man in the 1950s, programmed by paper that resembles an automatic piano roll. The Walt Disney Company and Walt Disney himself put this animated figure on hiatus because of the overly complex electronics that predated computers and transistors. The mechanics of this miniature automaton were comparatively massive, and engineers abandoned this project due to its complexity. The Buddy Ebsen Dancing Man, while not entirely successful, mechanically reproduced the human action of dancing. Animatronics became more fluid and lifelike with every technological development over time, getting closer to humanization. 1964 was the most important year for animatronics in the public eye because the World's Fair in New York City featured multiple iconic attractions created by WED Enterprises. As Talking Birds debuted at Disneyland's Enchanted Tiki Room on the West Coast, great moments with Mr. Lincoln, It's a Small World, The Carousel of Progress, and Ford's Magic Skyway debuted for East Coast and international audiences. The technological developments that executed the shows at the 1964 New York World's Fair were rapid and made public all at once. The most important technological developments in this era was in programming. Disney's proprietary show control unit, 
the digital animation control system allowed for motion tracking from a harness that an actor and programmer would wear. As a 1976 reviewer of Disney's America Sings attraction noted, such an approach of acting is entirely synthetic and a performance is constructed instant by instant rather than responding to an actor's internal impulses. Later on, control boards began to more precisely control animatronic movements, replacing hand grips with individual finger controls. The anthropomorphic audio animatronic is not just a mechanical reproduction of the human body, but it also mechanically reproduces human motion and animation. In attempting to approximate the human body, recreating human skin was a major obstacle. Materials engineers at the Walt Disney Company, and by extension, other animatronic manufacturing firms, had to overcome the great challenge of replicating human skin that was both functional and believable. Vinyl skin envelops a fiberglass skeleton, taking on stage makeup so audience members at any distance can read the figure's features. Latex substances began to replace vinyl because the material has memory and elasticity. Disney research scientists at the 1996 American Chemical Society meeting in Orlando discussed the difficulties of creating and maintaining these polymers. Any material, no matter how tough, is bound to fail after many repetitions of a movement. Therefore, the polymer must also be easier to repair. The real cost isn't the injection or the molding process. It's in the labor required after the figure has been cast. Durability and flexibility are paramount for keeping a robotic performer of any species alive. Engineers do not want mechanical pirates and Abraham Lincoln to crack at the lips and tear at the skin. So, these animatronics require a large amount of upkeep. Unlike the human body, the animatronic body cannot heal itself. Rather, it is up to the engineers to take care of animatronics through malfunctions that destroyed believability and crawled deeper into the uncanny valley. In the recent past, animatronics have begun to use artificial intelligence in order to become interactive. In 2007, an American inventor named Jean P. Hamilton filed a patent for an AI that models human physical behavior and actions. This AI is trained using an input that matches the persona of a historical figure in order to both educate and entertain. The patent states, It would be even more spectacular and enlightening to be able to ask questions of Mr. Lincoln, both about his own era and his thoughts and impressions of our time and civilization. To be able to converse with President Lincoln in real time would indeed be a unique experience for anyone. Other historical figures mentioned in this patent are limited to Plato, Martin Luther, Sir Isaac Newton, Andrew Carnegie, Abraham Lincoln, Mahatma Gandhi, and Sir Winston Churchill. Each historical figure's AI would be programmed using various overlapping brain parameters that match human characteristics and behavioral patterns. Before AI, Engineers humanized robots by giving them precise commands and exact electrical inputs. In the future, these robots will be humanized not only by their movements and behaviors, but also their decisions to behave the way they choose. In conclusion, the creation of artificial bodies, whether in the form of wax figures or animatronics, represents a fascinating intersection of art, science, and technology. These lifelike replicas have a live aura and presence as works of art but they lack the unique aura of human life and the capacity for experience. Today, we will be looking at how Africa is depicted in Western theme parks. So, if you would be so kind to like, comment, and subscribe, I would greatly appreciate it. Let's jump in. Representations of Africa in American and European theme parks reveal a continuity from the colonial era where white corporations and businesses continue to exoticize the so-called dark continent for their audiences. Before exploring specific attractions, themed lands, and theme parks, it is important to first understand the concept of Africa in the Western imagination. Dr. Curtis A. Keem's monograph, Mistaking Africa, Curiosities and Inventions of the American Mind, provides a framework to understand depictions of Africa in American theme parks. Dr. Keem asked his students to create a list of words that come to mind when thinking about Africa. His students came up with traditional words, native, savage, hut, 
tribe, and cannibals. Tourism words, safari, pyramid, wild animals. News words, poverty, ignorance, tragedy. Change words that indicated Western-induced change, like development, missionary, and foreign aid. And occasionally, the students came up with racist words. We learned to accept these myths from popular culture and television culture, cartoons, news, nature documentaries, ethnography documentaries on the learning channels, and in this case, themed entertainment parks. Theme parks make Africa seem excitingly different and exotic within Western imaginations. Comparing Six Flags Great Adventure and Wild Safari, Bush Gardens, The Dark Continent, and Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park reveals a through line in a greater landscape of safari theme parks. As Curtis A. Keem noted, these parks respond to demand. Quote, We prefer rural ethnography and find nature more interesting and enlightening than daily life in urban cities where people actually reside. There are three patterns that are recognizable and consistent when it comes to depicting Africa in these theme parks. First, there is the tendency to manufacture nature on demand through animal exhibits that conceal many natural aspects of wildlife while also presenting themselves as natural environments. Second, these parks tend to exhibit Africa as either a homogeneous entity and sometimes a group of spaces without giving context to adequately represent the peoples and cultures they imagine. Third, these parks cement Africa in Western imaginations as an exotic land that is excitingly different. The first attraction that we will look at is Six Flags Great Adventure's indoor roller coaster, Skull Mountain. Opened in 1996, Skull Mountain has a dark atmosphere of foreboding that sent a message to theme park guests that they were entering a dangerous place. During the early years of the attraction, 1996 to 1998, Skull Mountain had a detailed queue, rare for a Six Flags amusement park, that depicted a non-specific African village. A 1996 press release set the stage for visitors embarking to explore Skull Mountain. The visual story unfolds as guests enter the jungle pathway which leads to Skull Mountain's entrance. Guests take on the role of explorers attempting to discover the secret of the mountain's origin. As they wind through an elaborate path surrounded by lush, tropical vegetation, visitors encounter signs of previously failed expeditions, including overturned jeeps, abandoned campsites, and the remains of previous explorers. Spears, shields, and totems with African-like insignias surrounded the abandoned dig site of the story's archaeologist. The huts were small and thatched. Interesting to note were the large cauldrons in the queue, large enough to fit a human. With the way it was positioned, no one could see what's inside, so guests were led to imagine that previous explorers had become the cannibal natives' lunch. As for the ride itself, it remains not much more than a lightly themed roller coaster in a metal box. Between the first and second tire-driven lift hills, riders on expedition trains passed by the human skeleton of an explorer who wore a colonial pith helmet and hat and between him and the wall was a native shield. In the context of the attraction story, they were about to suffer the same fate as this western explorer who encountered the natives of Skull Mountain. These theming elements reinforce American imaginations that heralded Africa as a primitive and backward space from the colonial past, never allowed to exist in the present. The exoticism present in Skull Mountain, and by extension other similarly themed attractions, portrays Africa as excitingly different. Usually this is at the expense of African culture and an extraordinary person of which is removed from its everyday context in a way that allows us to believe that the wider culture itself is wholly extraordinary. Attractions like Skull Mountain misrepresent and mistake Africa because they present the continent as mysterious, mystifying, and completely other. Similar exoticizing depictions of Africa laid in the same Adventure River section of Six Flags Great Adventure. This 1991 parkland included slide towers lightly themed to North American, Asian, and African rivers. A sign positioned near the entrance of the African slides encouraged guests to discover the dark continent and explore its mighty rivers. The headliner attraction was a 12-person white water rapids ride the first of its kind. 
Six Flags changed the 1981 Roaring Rapids attraction name to the Congo Rapids when the Adventure Rivers area of the park opened, explicitly altering the theming to be consistent with American imaginations of Africa. On the current attraction listing, Six Flags encourages Congo Rapids riders to get ready to get wet, gear up for the ultimate whitewater river rafting experience on this exotic and exciting float through the dense jungle. To be clear, there is nothing exotic about the ride itself, only insofar as the park associates the name and theming to Africa. More notably, the operators at the Roaring Rapids slash Congo Rapids were the only crew members with a specialized uniform, safari-style shirts, khaki shorts, and pith helmets to block out the sun. This dress harkened back to a historical period of imperialism, as the safari expedition uniform consistently appears in both the Congo Rapids and Skull Mountain. Because Six Flags Great Adventure is a large but typical regional chain amusement park, this theming and visual language extends to countless other American and European theme parks. Rides across the Atlantic also use this visual language to differentiate between the civilized and the savage. Monsieur Cannibal at De Efteling Theme Park in the Katsuval, Netherlands, debuted in 1988. This teacup-style flat ride perpetuated the same cannibal stereotypes about non-Western peoples through its marquee figure. The figure had no animation, and it was totally other and inhuman. This Monsieur Cannibal was half devil and half child, as Rudyard Kipling described in The White Man's Burden. Monsieur Cannibal is holding a white Tarzan child, and it cannot learn how to properly use a spoon for the ice cream it eats seemingly drunkenly. It wears the spoon as a piercing. I use the word it intentionally to demonstrate that Efteling designed this character to be readably non-human. If you've made it this far, please consider subscribing. Another safari amusement park themed to Africa Bush Gardens Tampa used to go by the name of Bush Gardens The Dark Continent. The Dark Continent theme park exoticized the continent of Africa by failing to provide context to the peoples, nations, and cultures it claimed to fairly represent. According to Curtis A. Keene, exoticism portrays only a portion of a culture and allows the imagination to use stereotypes to fill in the missing pieces. So we extrapolate that other people are more different from us than they are similar. With the name The Dark Continent, the Anheuser-Busch Company presented Africa as an unknowable and mysterious place, sustaining Western myths about Africa. Curtis A. Keene, when writing, was aware of theme park's ability to captivate the imagination and make Africa, again, excitingly different. Keene analyzed a 1970s poster that advertised the park. The poster depicted a white family in an African environment, the husband and a safari suit and pith helmet, holding a chimpanzee and pointing to some off-poster site, with his wife looking on passively. His children are also following in his gaze. From the back of the elephant, an Arab or Swahili guide in flowing robes looks on, while three barely visible black African men dressed in loincloths carry the family's luggage. Bush Gardens, The Dark Continent, no longer used the poster, of which I could not find on the internet. They removed the poster due to protest. In 1996, the park rebranded itself into Bush Gardens, Tampa, with a pledge and a promise to do education, conservation, and research. However, the Ubanga Banga bumper cars, which used a fake African-sounding name, in the Congo section of the park still exists. The Congo section of the park was previously named Stanleyville, after the colonial town that bore the name of the violent white conqueror of the Belgian Congo. Bush Gardens Tampa wants us to forget about its previous name and history, precisely because they knew that they generalized and mistaked Africa, still trying to cover their backs with facades of education. The Walt Disney Company attempted to avoid negative depictions of Africa and Asia with the creation of Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park in 1998. Regardless, the park continues to reinforce many tropes of exoticism that mistake Africa as a single homogenous space. Kilimanjaro Safari is the headliner attraction in the Africa-themed land in Animal Kingdom. Keem acknowledges how conquest nostalgia is being sold by the attraction's dilapidated colonial-era outpost. 
Kilimanjaro safaris also has many scenes where nature is on demand, as story beats are triggered as the safari-themed bus traverses the course. The storyline is a hunt for poachers, of which Keem observed to model Disney's other enterprises, which from their founding in the 1950s have epitomized the Western dream of the conquest and management of nature through science and technology. The Animal Kingdom designers took a three-week safari trip to Africa, where they were planning the park and its headliner, Kilimanjaro Safari. Authenticity, either real or perceived, was the utmost goal of theming an area to Africa. Animal footprints, tire tracks, and large aggregate are all part of reproducing and simulating the African continent for Western audiences. Claiming authenticity allows audiences to mistake Africa because it distracts from the fact that it is simulacra. The goal of the theme park designer is to make you forget that the environments are simulacra, to turn the hyper-real into the real. Theme park designers across the board continue to depict Africa as a homogenous place, more important for its rural ethnography than its more urban reality. Theme parks of all budgets, from Six Flags to Efteling, use Africa as a theme because white Western audiences find it excitingly different. Exoticism plays a massive role in these post-colonial presentations of African people and places. In theme park design, the aesthetics of the colonial period prevail over the aesthetics of an independent Africa because white and Western audiences see themselves not alongside simulated Africans, but alongside the diegetic colonizers in African stories. I'm Historical Method Man, and stay tuned for another part of Animatronics, Theme Parks, and Race. If you've made it this far, please consider subscribing. I would greatly appreciate it. Depictions of North American Indians The same processes that relate to Africa above apply to white and Western exhibitions and embodiments of American Indians, from public world's fairs to private theme parks. There has been a considerable amount of research on Walt Disney's frontier land in constructing the American West in collective memory. However, historians have seldom analyzed the attractions that portray Native Americans in detail. Moreover, historians tend to neglect exhibitions of Native Americans in themed entertainment outside of Disney theme parks. To better understand how the white gaze distorts images of Native Americans, Robert F. Burkhofer Jr.'s The White Man's Indian, Images of the American Indian from Columbus to Present, 1979, serves as guiding frameworks. Burkhofer came to similar conclusions as the other frameworks concerned with the construction of difference. First, white visual culture generalizes Native American societies and cultures into one homogenous idea. Second, the white gaze defines Native Americans through deficiencies and opposition to white ideals. Third, the white gaze describes Native Americans through highly subjective moral evaluations. Fourth, the white gaze thinks of Native Americans in the past tense, not considered in the present. Burkhofer comes to the same conclusion as Keem and Said, wherein the observer always defined the other as lacking civilization. All of these tropes not only were a continuity from world's fairs, present in multiple Disney frontier lands, but they also extend to other regional amusement parks across the United States. Previous research brought me to William Henry Jackson's photography and exhibition of Native Americans at the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. White organizers excluded Native Americans from participations in the exhibit. Therefore, the inanimate nature of the North American Indian exhibit at the Centennial Exhibition peddled the idea that Native Americans were a vanished race. The exclusion of actual indigenous Americans in favor of an animatronic Native American body captured white imaginations nearly 100 years later at the 1974 World's Fair in Spokane, Washington. Native American novelist Sherman Alexie reflected on when he was eight years old and became fascinated with the animatronic Indian chief at the fair, 45 minutes from the Spokane Indian Reservation. He reminisced on how the robot invoked the soul and words of Chief Joseph, Sitting Bull, Geronimo, and Chief Seattle. They wrote, As the rest of my family, along with a few other representatives of our tribe, dance for tourists, I spent hours listening to that puppet chief talk. I memorized the speeches and entertained my family by reciting them word for word on our nightly drive back home to our reservation. Later in the editorial, Alexi argued that Native American people are not the primary audience of Native American museums and exhibits. 
Richard Francoviglio wrote the most comprehensive study of Walt Disney's frontier land, for he explored Walt Disney's vision of the American West while creating Disneyland in the mid-20th century. Walt Disney was highly involved in the design and construction of the land west of the park's compass-like hub. He personally designed the river system and Tom Sawyer Island. He laid out the island to scale with all the little inlets on the island, admonishing his designers to quit fooling around and draw it as it should be. The land acts as Walt Disney's three-dimensional mental map of the American West and Native American nations around the closing of the frontier, as marked by Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis in 1893, the decade before Disney was born. Frontierland was and is a land themed to exploration, discovery, and industry. Disneyland's designers placed attractions, shops, and exhibits themed to Native America on the westernmost periphery of the park. The now defunct attractions were the Indian Village, Indian War Canoes, and the Ceremonial Dance Show. The Indian Village was the primary attraction of Frontierland's westernmost periphery. Yesterland's description of the walkthrough that lasted until 1971 encourages guests to wander among the teepees of the Plains Indians, an Iroquois birch bark longhouse, and a cedar plank house and totem poles of the Indians of the Pacific Northwest. There's even an Indian burial ground. This ethnographic exhibit seems to be intended to educate and entertain guests using Native American art, architecture, and culture. However, the title Indian Village and Physical Design represented Native American peoples and nations as one homogenous group. To suggest greater authenticity, guests at Disneyland's Indian Village could meet a full-blooded Indian chief, and more importantly, take photographs with him. Chief Whitehorse, Truman Washington Daily, 1898-1996, was the last fluent speaker of the Oto Missouri language. He was a genuine actor who used Disneyland as a means to preserve, by any means necessary, knowledge about his nation. Within Indian country, there was a clear difference between the surveyor and the surveyed that reflects a greater continuity within ethnographic and colonial photography, especially in the American West. As Jane Collins and Catherine Lutz discussed in the photograph as an intersection of gazes, White's ability, position, and willingness to be the surveyor permeates the self-defining logic of constructing difference and making of the other. The gaze, in its lack of reciprocity, is distinctly colonial. The Westerners do not seek a relationship, but are content, even happy, to view the other as ethnic object. In pictures which include a Westerner, we can also potentially see ourselves being viewed by the other, and become aware of ourselves as actors in the world. In Disneyland, White guests were observers of an imagineered interpretation of Native American culture, wherein the imagineers were overwhelmingly white men with little to no lived experience of any Native American identity. The Walt Disney Company's representations of Native American peoples have improved little over time, most strongly evidenced by the Chief Joseph figure in the American Adventure. The animatronic Chief Joseph offers an argument for Native American assimilation into one country while simultaneously relegating Native American history behind the 1890 closing of the frontier. I hope that all of us may be brothers. We're the one country around us and one government for all. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. The real Chief Joseph, Imatuya Latlat, thunder traveling over the mountains, was the leader of the Ned's Percy Nation in the land now known as Idaho. The story of his nation was not one that hoped for one country around us and one government for all. His father refused to sign a treaty with Governor Isaac Stephen that demarcated land to separate whites and Native Americans in preparation for a massive settler migration westward. No man can think for me. I have no other home than this. I will not give it up to any man. Take away your paper. I will not touch it with my hand. Eight years later, the United States claimed to have legitimately bought the Nez Perce's land without any consent from the Nez Perce themselves. Robert F. Burkover Jr. argued that settler states made rhetorical and eventually substantial efforts to incorporate the indigenous survivors of the dispossession into their new nations. The nation is an imagined community, and theme park attractions like the American Adventure are all able to tell a story of specific nations. The Imagineers created a mechanical reproduction of Chief Joseph and made him say recorded words in support of what he and his father stood against. 
Both the Chief Joseph Audio Animatronic and Disneyland's Frontierland relegate Native Americans to a historic past that ended with Frederick Jackson Turner's Frontier Thesis at the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. In these fictional lands themed to an imagined historic past, white designers did not view all Native Americans equally. Storytellers wrote the animatronic Chief Joseph to be supportive of the policy of expansion with honor. Thus, the artificial reproduction of the real Chief Joseph was a good Indian because he supported assimilation. This trend that Burkover outlined is equally relevant in Frontierland's Indian country-themed area. The script on the Santa Fe and Disneyland Railroad in 1962 extolled good Indians and warned of bad ones. Some Indians are hostile, and across the river is proof, a settler's cabin of fire. The pioneer lies in his yard, victim of an Indian arrow. Ahead is a friendly Indian village with the inhabitants active in their daily tribal chores. Native Americans both endangered and were endangered by the westward course of so-called civilization. In Walt Disney's Frontierland, the pioneers were the heroes in a war of industry versus nature, savagery versus civilization, and assimilation versus vanishing. Depictions of indigenous North Americans in Western theme parks placed American Indian peoples and nations into an ahistorical and static past, never in the dynamic present. These depictions differentiated between good and bad American Indians, where those written to assimilate take precedence over others who wanted to live as they had. Theme park guests, generally white and of the upper classes, have a distinctly colonial relationship because they have the right to observe American Indian bodies. Theme parks put words into American Indian-themed animatronics mouths and speak for them, often without consulting those who have a stake in indigenous issues. <laughs>